have any folks that would probably be able to use the assault Bible class. Um, if you uh, don't have a Bible, please make sure you get one, whether you have a physical one on your phone, and if you need a handout, you're also going to have to in the back. Um, if you would, would you please join with me as we begin this morning in prayer? Father, it is always such a joy, it is such a privilege to know that we have the freedom in this country to gather as we are right now. Uh, here we are in this country, able to just freely join together to spend time with you and in your word. And so our trust is, is that your spirit is going to move mightily in this place this morning. Uh, speak deep into our hearts, Father. Our trust always is that your word that is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword is going to have that transformative effect in each of our lives. And so I trust that the words that I believe that you have given me to share with these uh, your beloved children uh, is going to have an impact in that way. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Amen. So we are continuing in our study in the book of Acts. And um, this is starting here at the beginning of the fall, as we move into September. Um, and this is going to continue through the rest of the fall here. And I don't know if you've read all of the book of Acts before. I trust that in your church and scriptures you have. Um, there is so much that is contained in this book as we see the church starting as it grows, as it expands, as it multiplies, as it starts to move throughout what is then known as the Middle world. And the impact that we want to understand, this was at the very beginning of that time, the death of Jesus with us, is that it's that key verse in very first one, that what we're reading about. Luke wants us the opposite. He wants you and me to know that this is in some ways a continuation of all that Jesus had actually begun to do and the work that he had done, the things that he did, the things that he taught, the way he lived his life. This is a continuation of that. And we're going to see that in a very marked way today as we see Jesus in the outer soul. Um, it is important to remember that uh, sometimes, although you never see that in any of your Bibles, it always talks about the Acts of the Apostles. And so the title of the book is called Acts of the Apostles. But there are many that in some way would prefer to see this as being phrased, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because you see the Holy Spirit flowing through the church at the very beginning. You see that power being demonstrated, you see the impact of this having in people's lives. And even as the disciples were watching Jesus engaging up into heaven, as he was ascending into heaven, the angels come and they say, hey, why are you doing that? There is work to do. There is a mission. And Jesus had very clearly made that mission for him to be his disciples, to do this teaching and this preaching in Jerusalem, and then all to be Samaria and into the ends of the earth. And we see that especially as after Jeff shared some of those thoughts behind Acts 6, 7, 8, 9, at the beginning of the night, I guess we're kind of dealing more specifically in the night, but this realization that after Stephen is martyred, on the all of a sudden see the Spirit moving to expand this ministry. And as it moves, we understand that there's going to be an impact. And whether you've heard this, if you've not seen it, I would encourage you to do this. Pastor Jeff has these little digging deeper. Four minutes, five minutes that you can see on the record yet YouTube site. And he just shares these wonderful insights. And one of those that he made about this chapter, I don't know if you mentioned this last week, but this is a pivotal point in the life of the church. Because you're going to see a man who is opposed to now all of a sudden be a proponent of this very gospel. So if you have your Bibles, if you would turn with me to chapter 9, and we want to look at these first couple of verses. Some of these I'll have on the screen, others I'll encourage you to follow them through the Bible. So the first two verses that we read, it says that but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, Went to the high priest and asked him for a letter to the synagogues of the Messiahs, so that he found, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. 
Paul uses some very, Luke uses some very strong words here in describing Saul and what he's doing is breathing out stress, even the point of murder. Now remember, he observed what happened to Stephen. He was there and he waited in tacit approval of the fact that Stephen was being martyred. And what is interesting to know, again, I apologize, I don't know if it was recorded, but I would always like to listen to these previous messages to know. I don't know if Pastor Jeff mentioned anything about this, but the sharp contrast between the leaders and Jesus Christ says, we can't put anybody to death, only one can do that. And now seeing these leaders putting somebody to death, and Saul is there. And these words, we don't, at the, end, at the beginning of chapter 8, it says Paul was ravaging the church. This isn't just trying to make it hard. He was ravaging the church. He was going into house after house after house, dragging men and women off and putting them into prison. <coughs> Later in Acts, um, Paul was going to be given a testimony to a man by the name of King Agrippa. And listen to how Paul describes what his life was like and what he was doing before we read about his conversion. Um, in your handout, it says Acts 22. This should be Acts 26. It's Acts 26. This is the testimony that he's given before King Agrippa. This is what he says to King Agrippa. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my bolts against them. And I punished them often in all synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them, even to four cities. This is quite a statement that Paul is given as a testimony here, Paul. Saul, and when this is happening, Saul is giving this testimony as to his mindset. And this, this is fascinating when you read this. You're saying, wow, what? this man has this incredible animosity. In fact, even later in Galatians, he writes this For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. A question. Why such animosity from this man? I mean, we know that the Sanhedrin, these leaders, were opposed to Jesus and then even to Peter and John were looking for it. But remember, Galileo had told the leadership, hey, let's not put these men to death. If this is of God, you might find yourself right in the sky. And this is man who will die. So, why in the world would Paul, Galileo, this is teacher. Why would not he be taking that same kind of sense? You know what? Let's just watch and let's wait and see. Because the last thing that he would want to do would be finding himself fighting against him. Why such an animosity? There's a uh, commentary that the analogy says the following. Whereas Stephen argued, the new has come, therefore the old must go. Saul's point was, the old must stay. Therefore, the new must go. Cold. What does he mean? This sense is, is that when you read through Scripture, Jesus' dialogue with all of the leadership all focused on tradition. In fact, Jesus lambasts the leaders because he's saying, You are making your traditions as if they are the rule and the law of God Himself, and you're not understanding how you're destroying. Faith and the life of the people in their walk with God. And Paul is caught up in this. Paul is so opposed to anything that is coming contrary to the traditions that they are holding. And it calls us to be very, very cautious today. It is so easy for us to see this dynamic of what I call the old versus the new. We've always done it this way. You know what I mean to change that. Or to see something that is new. You know, years ago, there were changes that were taking place in our church back in Massachusetts. There was a gentleman that says, Dan, he said, he said, you and your wife, you're too, you know, you're, you're too liberal. 
We could have had a more solid stand on God's word. He said, well, because you want to change all of our traditions. And this is the reality of what Saul is encountering. Um, these words that he's using, these descriptions, this ravaging, he was trying to force people to blaspheme. Um, I wonder if we in the West uh, really can comprehend what it means to be persecuted. I don't know that um, we can grasp the reality of hearing the testimony of those who have uh, suffered for the world. They're losing their lives, literally, losing their lives. Imagine a 17 year old girl being thrown from her 17th floor apartment by her parents because she believed in Jesus. We can't comprehend it. Years ago, there was a man who was a leading imam, and he, he was probably the premier imam of all of Egypt as a Muslim. Uh, he is a converting, and he and his wife they would have to flee Egypt for their lives. And they end up at the seminary where my wife leaving was the dean of students in the Boston area. Now, this man. Lee and I used to invite the international students, and so we had people there from the underground church in China. We had this man as this converted human and he's in our house. And we're having some food and fellowship. And he says, Dan and Lee, he said, I'd like to pray for you. And when we heard about what he said, we said, you want to pray for us? We should be praying for you. And so he and some of the guys that were there, they got some chairs in the middle of our living room, sat down, and this man put his hands on us. And I don't think we didn't have ever heard a prayer that was so filled with a sense of who God is and who Jesus is before he ever asked a thing. A man who was a Muslim who ended up having to flee from his very life in our home, praying for us. Me and I have marveled because we just said, do we even understand the faith that it takes to be able to stand that way? And this is what's happening in your church. These are the people that Paul and Saul is going after. The ones who have seen their lives transformed and changed and who are refusing to say no. And these are the ones that Paul wants to devastate, ravage, kill. I had Damascus. Um, Damascus is north of Jerusalem in the Syria area. These are all Roman provinces. And um, <coughs> at this time, most historians, if you look at the history of Damascus, it will probably, you will see it being categorized as being the oldest city, inhabited city in the world. Damascus is referred to initially all the way back to just the 14th of Abraham. When his nephew Lot and their family get taken over by the people that are up from the north, they come down to Sodom and Gomorrah, they take him, they haul him off and take him up to the north, and Abraham goes after him and defeats those enemies in Damascus. Damascus is, is, becomes a state, and by all of the different empires that take over, um, they're taken over by the Babylonians, they're taken over by the Persians, then they're taken over by the Greeks, and then they're taken over by the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, and then eventually taken over by Rome. And in 64 BC, Rome, under the leadership of Pompeii, takes Damascus as a part of their state, their state. And what's happened at this time, Jews now start to migrate up to this area because of Rome being in control and the Roman road and the east moving to the point where you'll see this through this. Famous Jewish historian indicates that there are probably 10,000 plus Jews that are living in Damascus, which means they're living in a lot of synagogues. And these are the synagogues that Saul wants to go to. Um, there is a large Jewish population. Large. And so Saul is going to have this 
wonderful opportunity to do it all, but he's to root out these people. But there's a phrase that is used there, and some of this, I, I knew the Bible says and never studied some of this, they just read some of this. Did you catch something there? Why did he have these letters? It says that he needed to get letters from the high priest before he ended up and asked, what in the world are these letters for? When Rome took over, um, it's a sovereign state, and Rome instituted that if you were going to take somebody from one state to another state for some reason, you had to have a letter of expedition. And so at this time, when Caesar, Julius Caesar, in 47 BC, comes on the scene, he takes that same law of expedition and fine tunes it just a little bit and gives the privilege to the high priest. So Saul is going to the high priest to get a letter of extradition that is going to allow him to be able to take people from the Syrian state and bring them back to the Judean state, back to Jerusalem. And so that's why he needs these letters. And we see this, this isn't in our scriptures because it's part of the Apocrypha, but in the first Maccabees, we read the following, Therefore, if any scoundrels have fled to you from their country, hand them over to the high priest Simon, so that he may pass them according to their law. The implication here is, is that with this letter of extradition, you can turn these people over to the high priest for them to be able to handle whatever is going to be needed. So Saul is going to a large Jewish population of Damascus. He now has these letters of extradition that's going to give him the right be able to bring these people back. The other phrase that is used in there is the way. This phrase, the way, is only used six times in all of Scripture. Only in Acts. The only other time that we see some kind of phrase used like this is when Jesus talks to his disciples and says, I am the way. So it appears that for those who have turned their lives over and are submitting out to Jesus are seeing the reality of this truth of Jesus declaring, I am the way. Now see them as a part of the way. Okay, the Bible says pick up and we're going to read uh, verses 3 through 9. This is where Saul has his encounter with Jesus. Now, as he went in his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice that seemed no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing, so they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now this conversion experience is recorded. This is Luke writing this as a testimony as to what happened with Saul. Two other times, both in Acts 22 and in Acts 26, Paul, at this time, now going by Paul, gives his testimony first to the people who are in Jerusalem because they're challenging him in terms of his mission work he's doing. And the second time is in Acts 26, and he does this before King Agrippa. And when you read both of those accounts, it adds additional insights as to what took place here in Acts 9. And one of those is in Acts 26, where this phrase when he uses it, Jesus says to him, Saul, so don't you know it's hard to kick against the goat? Um, if you haven't had your notes that were from last week, if you were here, uh, Jeff had this put down as a little thing. This, this is like an ox wheel. This is a pointed rod. This is a rod that has a little metal point on the end of it. And when a farmer wants to get his oxen to either go or to change direction, they take this prod and hit the back foot. Hit the heel of that back foot. So if you wanted to go to the Right, hit the left one. If you wanted to go left, hit the right one. If you wanted to go, you just hit it. Well, what happens is that even like us, we can be stubborn. And so what does the oxen do? It kicks against the goat. Well, guess what happens? 
that person up is to be tried of, but if you kick it, you're actually harming yourself. And Jesus is saying to him, why in the world are you resisting me? Now you have to stop this for a second. Um, and think from a time standpoint. Jesus gives no indication of how long this is going on. But the sense is, this isn't just who, this isn't just how. He says, why are you kicking against me? The implication being is that Saul, in his mind, must know that there is something that's true. That is so resistant, that has so much animosity, that he just keeps kicking against harming himself. Two other thoughts on this passage. Um, sometimes you may have heard this by people. They, they call this the daddy Damascus Road experience. Uh, the implication being is that you're seeing somebody whose life is going one direction, and then because of their encounter with Jesus, a hundred and eight to return, they're going in the complete opposite direction, and you want them to know, whoa, what in the world? This can only be the work of God. Um, the seminary that I was at was a reform seminary. A lot of those who come out of the tradition where you had to make a decision for Jesus. So I was asked one day, well, when did you become a Christian? So I went out to pass. Uh, you didn't have like a master's of experience? You didn't have your life was going this way and all of a sudden you turned your life over to Jesus and you're going the opposite direction? No. Uh, Great care has to be exercised. God is going to do work in people's lives that in some ways is going to just bottom of the line. And it causes us to ask a couple of questions. Who chooses whom? Do we choose Jesus? Or does Jesus choose us? Jesus. Uh, folks, just so that you understand, this has been a question that has been throughout all the church history. It's this question of do I need to decide for Jesus or did he choose me? When I was at the seminary, this was in the late 70s. No, I'm sorry, this is what I'm talking about in history. The seminary, we always have these less time for us, when these theologians would get together, they would debate different topics. And so one of those was a much longer debate on exactly this. And the emphasis comes around the understanding of baptism. Because the one side is going to say, you, know, you, can't, you can't baptize an infant because you're not old enough to choose to follow Jesus. And the other side is going to say, no, but if you follow the reform side, this is like predestined. God is the one who's done this, and you don't really have to do with anything. So this dialogue is going on, going back and forth, and trying to debate whether you baptize infants or not, or whether you have to believe first, and then you're baptized, and go back and forth. It was all over with, and I was talking with one of the key theologians at the seminary, and I said, wow, I said, I'm so sorry they didn't present the third option. He said, what? What is third option? And I said, well, who's this? He said, what's that? And I said, it's not either or. <coughs> it's, it's not either one or the other. Luther says it's both and. What do you mean? I said, scripture teaches right that you have to choose, but also teaches that you can go. And I said, well, then why can't you believe that? He said, wow, man. And then he very gently <coughs> and firmly chastised me for not raising that point in the form. It has causes a lot of confusion. And the challenge is, can we actually believe both? Did Saul do anything? There's nothing in this narrative that he might say, I see the light. Or is it Jesus coming in and saying, hey, Saul, this is me. You're persecuting me. Um, and I can't think of this. You're before heaven, before the pearly gates, and there you see this statement that says, Come. What is the implication? 
You and I have to choose to enter through that gate. We have to choose to enter into eternal life in Jesus Christ. The problem is, you walk through the gate, and you turn around and you look at the back side of the gate, and it says, shows. Now, how is that possible? Folks, I don't know. Um, how is that possible? I know that both are true. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, and he said to all, and anyone who would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You cannot read anything else into that passage other than you and I need to make a choice. Are you going to follow him or not? But Paul writes in Ephesians, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Just a minute, Paul, how is that possible? How is it possible for you and me to have to have this sense of choosing? Or Paul says, just a minute. Remember, he's writing this in the context of him knowing what his conversion experience was like when he looked at Damascus. He brings these two together in Galatians. But when he, Jesus, who has set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal the Son to me in order that I might reach into the Gentiles. The two truths are wrapped up in this one verse, these two verses. He had been set apart before he was even born, chosen. But God called him to which he needed to respond and follow. Paul could have very easily, in this experience that he could have said, Jesus, thanks, but no thanks. So what are we going to do? Folks, anytime you read the end of the scripture, and it becomes so difficult to understand, if there's anything that you leave from here this morning, I want you to take this truth, and I want you to take it and hold on to it with everything that you have, because you and I are going to encounter Situations that arise that we cannot explain. You cannot explain Jesus being God and man at the same time. You cannot explain the Trinity. You cannot explain do we choose or are we chosen. But I can tell you one thing that you can do. You can do this. You can trust God even when you do not understand. And that is what I want to encourage you to do as we continue through this and as you can read any book of Scripture. If you cannot understand it, you say, you know what? I can't understand it. Someone wants to try to find it. I don't know, but one thing I do know, I'm going to trust my God. Um, this becomes absolutely important. That's why we hold so strongly to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You know, we have this understanding that it's by grace, this is a gift. This faith you and I have is a gift. We can't earn it, we can't do anything about it. We can't just say, well, see, oh, what work? I did this, I did this, and I can take this. If people hold to this testimony that you have to choose to decide to follow Jesus, guess what? You can choose to unfollow him. And our Lutheran doctrine is both of these are held in tension, but both of them are true at exactly the same time. Turn your wife, we want to pick up on verse 10. Now there was a disciple of Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him, in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And of the house of and of the house of Judas went for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for he will be his praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might be in his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from about many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And they, here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call to your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to carry my name before the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appears to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
and immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. Um, what a marvelous testament. Um, come on, awesome this. Uh, I don't know whether you caught this or not, but you go back and look at it. There's a vision within a vision. So Jesus held Ananias in a vision that Saul had a vision. And these visions are both giving a testimony to the same truth as to what God is going to be doing in Saul's life. And so even though Ananias knows this, he is reluctantly, it is understandable, he is reluctant to go. And I don't know if there's any of us that would not have that same kind of right. If you knew that somebody had been persecuted in the church and then you were told to go and visit them and pray for them, I don't know that our initial response would be, hey, yeah, let's go. As much as it would be to say, Lord, am I really hearing you correctly? Um, visions and dreams, does that still happen today? Um, we in the West were a little bit skeptical of this. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, he and I have the privilege over the years to have encounters with people from literally all over the world. Both uh, through mission trips and through international students that would come to the seminary. And if there's anything that we've learned, uh, these things that we see that are visions and trained, which we here in the West hold with a little bit of skepticism. This is a crazy occurrence. We had a dear friend of ours named Yusuf from Egypt. And he was studying at the seminary. And when he would come, he would stay with us. He would live in our, live in our home. And so we and I had small groups of young 20s and 30s couples that were in our home. So he would be in our home and we just had a wonderful conversation with him. And so one day, he would be there, Yusuf. Who's the thing that came to follow Jesus? You see, because he too was a staff Muslim. And we wanted to know what in the world, how, how did this happen? Because he's a little man. He said, I don't know that I'm going to tell you. He says, Good, I don't think you're going to believe me. He said, Yes, tell us. He said, Jesus visited me in a vision. He said, Oh, we believe it. He did it with Saul. Why did he not do it with you? He was relieved. We believe it. And guess what? Here is this man who had the life that was converted and took on a life that was very similar to Saul. This, now, this man now travels through all of the Arab speaking countries to see where there are Christians, to encourage, to spur them on. His wife. This is a psychologist, psychiatrist. She's a, she has a degree in counseling from this same center. And she has gone into war torn areas to provide counseling for those that are suffering with PTSD, Muslims, and has this opportunity. See, we, they and I, our minds were just poverty. We said, all because of a vision. Folks, I would encourage you, there's always going to be this tension between whether or not you feel that you heard a voice from the Lord or that this was Jesus speaking to you through a dream at night. Um, there always is going to be that tension as to whether we follow that or no. The encouragement is allow yourself to have this sense, you know what, I know that he does this. He has, he will, and he will continue to do this. As I mentioned, this experience that he has is mentioned two other times. And the one in Acts 22 has an interesting little addition to what happened to Saul when Ananias speaks to him. And it's the following. And Ananias says to him, and now, why do you wait? Speaking to Saul, rise and be baptized. And then he asks this phrase, wash away your sins. On his name. There are going to be those that are going to indicate that you believe and that are baptized. Um, 
The sense is baptism doesn't really accomplish anything other than it just gives a testimony to those who are watching you do this to say you believe in Jesus. But there's nothing else going on. This passage says, ooh, there is a washing away of sin that is taking place. That is, that's why we, in our understanding and our doctrine, our understanding this is God through His Word and God through His water that is accomplishing something. Can't be stated any clearer. And so Saul's life changes immediately. And we see that as we continue in Acts 9. So this is picking up at verse 19 of the last chapter. For some days he was with the disciples of Damascus, speaking of Saul, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem? And those who call upon his name? And he has not come. And has he not come here for this purpose to bring him down before the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Um, what a dramatic change. And immediately, immediately he goes to the synagogues and starts this preaching and this teaching and demonstrating and proving that Jesus was. Now remember, this was this hallmark, proving that Jesus, this is what he said he is, he said, proving that Jesus was the Christ, the anointed, the Messiah, the one that had been promised in the Old Testament. And Paul is now making this as a clear declaration, and he goes to the synagogues. Saul does something here that he's going to do, he's going to read through all of the rest of Acts. Now, when he starts on his missionary journeys, he starts to head up into the Asia Minor area and then he's over to the Acacian area. His own word increases and then what does he do? The first place that he goes to in every city that he encounters is the synagogue. This is what he does. He's going to his people. He's going to those who should know the promises that have been made in the Old Testament. And there are going to be those that are going to respond and then there are going to be those that are not going to respond. And so his statement here is, is that he becomes, in today's terminology, we would use this defender of the faith, we would use an apologist. Not making an apology for doing something, but apology being a defense. And so those who are gifted apologists, as Christian apologists, have this way of just taking what is in scripture and weaving it together in a powerful way and then boom, proving but an interesting dynamic here, is it not? Even though he is proving this, that does not mean that people are going to respond. He himself was kicking against the goat. And the same thing that ends up happening to Peter and, and John and others that we see, that all of a sudden, when there's this intensity of what's going on, what happens? Acts 9, verse 23 and 25. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. And they were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. His disciples took him by night and let him out through an opening of the wall, boring him in a basket. So there are 10,000 plus Jews living in Damascus. Saul is coming with the intent to root out those that are following the way that had to be the Jews that were saying, yes, yes, yes. But there were those who were Christians who were part of the way that are confounded because they can't figure out what Saul is doing, what's happening to him. But obviously it becomes known to both these Jews and they seek out to kill him. Um, I found this image. I, I don't know why this was popping with my brain when I was when I was preparing this, but for some reason I it kind of rewound my early childhood. I can remember sitting in a Sunday school class, and I don't know why, but this image, this is one of these stories that you tell children about Saul. And just seeing these disciples warring him in a basket. 
to his freedom. And the reality is, is that uh, these are the very ones that wanted to Paul that Saul was seeking to kill. Just right there in them. The ones that Saul is seeking to kill are the ones that are now helping him to escape by luring him in this basket. I just think it's, it's fascinating to read these stories and read this, this historical narrative of what was going on in Saul's life. And my encouragement is to realize that when you and I get caught in areas and times where maybe there might be some danger, just to know, you know what? What a marvelous way that the Holy Spirit provides and moves for them to rescue Saul by lowering him in the basket. We pick up in verse 26. Saul now finds himself in Jerusalem. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him. For they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how long ago he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him out of Caesarea and sent him on to Tarsus. Remember, that's where he's from. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Uh, understandably so, even as the believers in Damascus were skeptical about what had happened um, and why this Paul all of a sudden is now preaching this is where he wanted to destroy Jesus, so the disciples in Jerusalem are experiencing exactly the same way. And it always raises the question, um, how do we really, how do you know that somebody has really made a profession of Faith, or how do you know if somebody declares, I am a Christian, and whether that's real? Because you and I cannot judge the heart. And the disciples here are concerned. So, what happens? There's a testimony by a man that we encountered earlier in the church who had sold property and laid it in the disciples' feet so that it could be distributed. His name was Joseph. But the disciples called him Barnabas because of some of the things. And this man steps forward and says, I've got a testimony. This is what he has been doing. And it is that testimony then that causes the church, the disciples, to then receive him. It was interesting. I wonder if there's other band of people I mean, you might know that have gone through this and be like, what? Really? This is the following four that I found. I said, hmm. So a little bit of research. Sure enough, we read your testimonies. I don't know what you do this or not, but Bob Dylan became a Christian. Jane Fonda became a Christian. George Sloan became a Christian. Chuck Norris became a Christian. Now, if you doubt that, go and Google their names and find out what they're doing today. Find out the testimony that they're doing. Bob Dylan, even in conscience, will make proclamations. I mean, all the other people remember Gacy Thomas? Yeah. Rain yeah. 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 He came to College Station when we were, when Gacy and I were there, we were dating at the time. There was a town hall that said, I'm going to go to Gacy Thomas. We get Thomas. And the end of his conference, at the end of his conference, he is a testimony. You can hear the reality is, is that the only way that you and I are going to know, the only way these disciples are going to know, the only way anybody is going to know, is that you and I have to do what Jesus said. You've got to look at the fruit. So I don't care what you're hearing today, what you're seeing today, or who's claiming to be Christian, look at the fruit. Is the fruit bearing witness that there's been a change in your heart? Barnabas says, hey, disciples, you know that this man's heart.
heart is going to change because this is what he is now doing. If you wouldn't have seen that, you could continue to be skeptical. If you question anybody, look at the fruit. And if you're not seeing the fruit, then question it. Because you don't know the heart, but you sure can know the fruit. And that's why Jesus says you're going to recognize them by the fruit of their bearing. And each of the lives of people that you encounter, if you look at just what at their life, look at what they're doing, how are they spending their money, what do they declare, who do they declare it to? Um, John writes it this way. He says, little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And so that's why we see Barnabas coming in and saying, just a minute, he defends what is taking place because of what Saul has done. There was an indication in that passage that one of the groups that he was encountering were the Hellenists. Um, I don't know if you remember this or not, but the Hellenists. The Hellenists are those who are Jews either by birth or by conversion who speak Greek. And if you remember that when the church was growing, this is where the disciples were running into problems because the widows of the Hellenists were complaining that they weren't being taken care of. And so that's when these seven deacons are raised up. So we want you to take care of them. Which means there are Hellenists who are Christian, but there are also Hellenists who are not Christian, who are Greek speaking. And it's this group that. Luke calls out and says, this is one of those groups that he's having problems with. To what extent? They want to kill him as well. And so this is when he flees then first to Caesarea, and then he travels on what I would assume would be my boat to his own town. Um, interesting note here, this is, some of this is my, so see these little places, I said, what? This is a big stuff, isn't it? They brought him down to Caesarea. So let me ask you, if you were, if I were to ask you, um, where are you, where are you going to be taking your vacation over Thanksgiving, and you told me that you were going to be going to Chicago, you would say, I'm going to go up to Chicago. If you were going to go to the valley, you would go down south. So we give directions based on something that is north is up, something that is south is down. He said, Damascus comes down to Jerusalem and he says he's gonna go down to Caesarea. I guess the Hebrews and the Jews must have to mixed up, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> Their direction didn't quite understand the north and south or east and west. So anyway, ah, why is that? Well, it's because of the law. And you're going to see this throughout all scripture. You read this. Now, this is just a little side note. Whether this is going to transform you or walk with Jesus, I don't know. It's just a little side note. <laughs> when they give directions in the Bible, it's always done by altitude, by <coughs> direction. So they are always going up to Jerusalem. No matter where you are in history, you're going to go down into Caesarea. You're going to go down to the areas that are of lower altitude. That is how they're describing it. In the Psalms, the last Psalm, there's a section of the Psalms that are known as the Psalms of Ascent. No matter where you are, you are ascending. You are going up to Jerusalem. So that whenever you're reading this, when you even thought about that or not, I don't know. I guess I did. But anyway, that's. It's on altitude and not on direction. The narrative here in Acts 9 now completely changes. Saul is now up in Tarsus, his hometown. Um, and so Luke switches gears and starts talking about Peter. And so if you look and pick up verse 32, now, as Peter went here and there along the wall, he came down also to the saints who lived in Leto. There he found a man named Aeneas, had been for eight years who was paralyzed, and Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ, he was alive, made the bed. And immediately he rose, and all the residents of Leto and Sharon saw him, 
and they turn to the Lord. So just to get that understanding, he goes up and down. He's in Jerusalem. He goes down to the this is where he encounters this man, uh, Aeneas. And now we don't know if the residents of Lydda, we have no idea how they have come to be followers of the way. We don't know if this is because of what took place at Pentecost, where there were men that would have been there, and they would have seen, they would have heard, they would have heard Peter's sermon and his preaching, and 3,000 in one time now, and then these people go back to their home. Or was this because of the ministry of Jesus? And just and having encountered him and believing in him. We don't know. But what we do know is there are saints, as it describes here, who are living in the And this always raises the question. When you look at this year test, it says all the residents of the and share saw him. I mean, saw him and immediately turned to the Lord all of them. The implication here is that this had an incredible effect on the people that live in this area. Now, just for geographical, we see that up, and then it says Sharon. And so, yes, there is an area, a village that may be known as Sharon, but it is also known as the Plain of Sharon. So that whole area would also be known as Sharon. So the implication is, is that whatever happened, when Peter did this, there is this tremendous turning to the Lord in this area of Israel. There's a second meaning. This is the first one. So follow me in starting in verse 36. Now, this wasn't Java, a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Doris. She was full of good works and had some charity. In those days, she became ill and died. And when she had washed her feet, it's apparent when she had washed, when they had washed her, they laid her in another room. Since Lydda was near job, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent him in and urging him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with him. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room, and all the widows, widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas sleep while she was with him. But Peter put them all aside and knelt down and prayed and turned to the vice of Tabitha the vice. When she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout the whole job. And many believed in the Lord. And he stayed out for many days with one Simon, a camera. So we see once again. In Joppa, there is this woman who is named Tabitha. And Tabitha is Aramaic, and that means gazelle. And in Greek, gazelle is translated as Dorcas. So that's why these names, there's always this time when you're going through and reading scripture, you're going to see sometimes dual names, even with Saul. Um, you know, there's no indication that Jesus changed his name from Saul to Paul. Um, these are Greek names and Hebrew names uh, that get used in, in mixed ways. But she becomes ill and dies. Now, Lydda is about 10 miles from Job. And so they send disciples to find Peter. Now, question. Do you think that those disciples were thinking that Peter was going to be able to raise her from the dead? Or were they just calling him because they wanted him to comfort him and to console him because this one had died? We don't know. We can imagine what might have been going through Peter's mind because the circumstances that you read were very, very similar to the situation when Peter was with Jesus and the whole situation with Jairus' daughter. I mean, the the text, the words that they use there are very, very similar. Coming, little there. Do you recognize all the warning that is going on? Jesus sending all of them out, and only taking them with him, the disciples. And then there he says, Talitha Kum, which is daughter of Arise. Peter here says, Tabitha, arise. And immediately is awakened. And we can only wonder what in the world we went through Peter's mind. Did he even think? That this was a possibility. Is it even possible that he 
he was saying, in my life, I can do this. Oh, no, he wouldn't have said, I can do this. He would have said, I know that by the power of the Holy Spirit, this is going to be possible. Now, we don't see, and there have been new, I was trying to research this, there have been new try to prove that even today, people have been raised from the dead. Um, nothing has ever been at all, any kind of this has been doing the research, they find out that it's a fraud. Um, but listen to what Jesus told his disciples when he was first doing ministry to them. And he sends the 12 out by twos to do ministry. And this is what he says to them Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. Cast out demons, you receive without pain, give without pain. When you read this narrative in Matthew, all you hear is that the disciples come back and rejoicing in what had taken place. But there's never a specific indication that they raised somebody from the dead. Remember, Jesus did this a number of times. He raised Jairus' daughter. He, he, he raised up the uh, widow son from Nan. He raised him. I found him. He raised up Lazarus. Um, so even in the Old Testament, you see what Elijah, Elijah did. So the reality of this is the question he comes to ask, can this still happen today? Do you believe that it is possible that somebody could be raised from the dead? So I looked at this. What would I tell this person? I'm asking the president, so I'm asking you the president. Just say that. Yeah. Oh, one commentary just said, said the following. I thought it was all this. He said, Do you believe that God can raise the dead? Can he? Yes. yes. So, can this happen today? Yes. yes. Does it happen today? We don't know. There's no no physical testimony that somebody has ever given a testimony to this that has ever happened. But I can tell you that there are a lot of circumstances where people have experienced these, quote, death type experiences where we're on a table and all of a sudden, bang! But as far as they're concerned, the doctor could have been, bang, they come back and they give these testimonies as to what they have seen. So, <coughs> yes. Um, the question or the statement is even though Jesus did. Even though Peter does this, does that mean that people are going to turn and follow Jesus? See, in our mind, we're wanting to say, wow, just look at this. Aeneas was right, was healed. Um, here we have Tabitha was raised from the dead. Surely people now know for certain that Jesus is real. But they don't. Um, I would like to suggest as we end this morning, um, we would love to see this happen. I would like to suggest to you that you and I can experience this in reality, even today, but in a different way. Uh, Jesus shares in chapter 15 a powerful tale about the five sons. Two sons, the one that goes and gets his inheritance, he builds his fence, and he blows it away. Then comes back, and his father opens up his heart, has a party, celebrates him, puts his robe on, brings him, celebrates him. The older brother is fit to be tied because he says, Dad, I have served you all my day, you didn't give me a party. And the father says, The father. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this, your brother. Was dead. He was alive. He was lost. He was found. Um, far more important than you and I seeing or experiencing even what Peter did here is to realize that when you make the statement that this became known and people believed in the Lord, those people were once dead and they are now alive. And I would like to challenge each of us this morning to think of this as we in our mission. Raising people who are spiritually dead. 
I don't know whether you've ever thought about it in that context, but that's all I can encourage you to do. Whether this is neighbors, or co-workers, or family members, <laughs> consider them to be dead. And you have the power of the Holy Spirit to raise them. Father, thank you for uh, providing this time for us this morning and we continue to uh, walk through this uh, book of Acts. I pray that as we hear these things, again, this is not just more information for us, Lord, but it becomes transforming. Allow us to have a sense of who you are and the power that is available, even us today, because of your Holy Spirit living in us. And so we thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen.